نبدأ الآن الجلسة الرابعة البحث العلمي والابتكار والتطوير المتحدثون في هذه الجلسة سمو الأميرة غيداء طلال رئيسة هيئة أمناء مؤسسة الحسين للسرطان هيو هير مهندس وعالم فيزيولوجي المسؤول عن المجموعة البحثية للأحياء الميكاترونية في مختبرات معهد ماساتشوستس للتكنولوجيا بيت موريس مستشار إداري في مجموعة آيسيس للابتكار جامعة إكسفورد ومدير عذرا روبن هانسون أيضا أستاذ الاقتصاد في جامعة جورج ميسن ومدير الجلسة فالنتينا قسيسية الرئيس التنفيذي لمؤسسة عبد الحميد شومان فليتفضلوا This is a very interesting session today. Where better than the Knowledge Summit can we discuss scientific research, innovation, and development? Conducting research is important to developing knowledge and information that drives innovation and paves the way to living healthier and longer lives. There is an ongoing debate that scientific research paves the way for the knowledge economy. It is said that research is the lifeblood of the knowledge economy. Research can drive high technology innovation and wealth creation. And in order to promote sustainable development, one must consider science, technology, and innovation. Unfortunately, there is still a north-south divide in research and innovation. While there are major breakthroughs in the north, our region is lagging behind in scientific research. The number of research papers that are published is low if compared to global numbers. Expenditures on research is negligible, and private sector funding is almost non-existent. Quality research in fast-moving technologies is still modest, and transfer of knowledge is a weakness that keeps acting on us. We cannot continue like this. We need to address and act upon these challenges. I'm not a scientist or a researcher myself, but I am privileged to head one of the first organizations in the region to support scientific research through the first Arab Award for Scientific Researchers. The award has introduced us to the great potential in the works of the researchers all over the Arab world. Some of the Gulf states have made leap steps in research and have started to allocate a large percentage of its GDP on research. Some have incorporated science, technology, and innovation in their education system and their national development agenda to make their economy less dependent on raw materials such as the oil and more knowledge-centric. A few days ago, His Royal Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid announced a $2 billion dirham fund that is equal to $544 million to support innovators and help them to transform ideas into innovation projects. The fund is expected to play a vital role in driving growth and economic development in the UAE. I'm very excited actually to be facilitating this session that hosts exceptional experts and innovators who will be able to give us more information on the topic. Um, let me introduce our panelists. I'll start by Her Royal Highness Princess Rida Talal. Um, after graduating from Georgetown University, uh, School of Foreign Service, Her Royal Highness pursued a career in journalism. In 1991, she married His Royal Highness Prince Talal bin Muhammad of Jordan, and the late King Hussein asked her to establish the International Press Office of the Royal Hashemite Court and to become his press secretary. In October 2001, His Majesty King Abdullah II appointed her as chairperson of the King Hussein Cancer Foundation and Center. As the wife of a cancer survivor, Princess Rida has devoted herself to the fight against cancer. Her Royal Highness is also a tireless fundraiser and advocate for the center. Our second panelist is uh, Hugh, Hugh Herr, who is an American rock climber, engineer, and biophysicist who heads the biomechatronics research group at the MIT Media Lab. He is creating bionic limbs 
that emulate the function of natural limbs. In, 2000, in, in 2011, Time magazine coined her the leader of bionic age because of his revolutionary work in the emerging field of biomechatronics technology that marries human physiology with electromechanics. It's too complicated for me. <laughs> <laughs> A double MVP well. himself, he is responsible for the breakthrough advances in bionic limbs that provide greater mobility and new hope to those with physical disabilities. In 2007, Her was presented with the 13th annual Haynes Award for Technology, the Economy, and Employment. Our third panelist is Pete Moyers. Pete is the managing consultant at ISIS ISIS Innovation. Um, well, Pete, <laughs> it's a challenge. University of Oxford, please. It's, the name is very challenging for us. Um, at the University of Oxford, he has 15 years of experience working within the triple helix of industry, innovation, academic output, and government funding. Pete has experience of working across multiple industry sectors, including environmental, automotive, aerospace, and food processing, identifying and integrating new technology to improve productivity, efficiency, profitability, and competitive advantage. Prior to joining IS, ISIS Enterprises, Pete worked for the National Physical Laboratory to grow their training and knowledge networks business. Our fourth panelist is Robin Hansen, who is an associate professor of economics at George Mason University and research associate at the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford University. He has a doctorate in social science from California Institute of Technology and master's degree in physics and philosophy from the University of Chicago and nine years of experience as a research programmer at Lockheed and NASA. Professor Hansen has diverse research interests, but has pioneered prediction markets. He was the first to write in detail about creating and subsidizing markets to gain better estimates on a wide variety of important topics. The King, I'll go back to Her uh, Royal Highness. The King Hussein Cancer Center has become one of the most prominent centers in the Arab region, if not the most prominent center, which we are very proud of. Uh, Your Highness, could you please tell us a little bit about the center and why do you think uh, research is very important in supporting innovative methods and treatments for cancer? Thank you, Valentina, um, for this very generous introduction. Uh, I'm not quite sure I deserve it, especially in the company of such renowned scientists and researchers. But I have my own story. I would like to take you back to the winter of 1992, to a freezing cold New York City. I was a young bride, and I was sitting on a bench in one of the corridors of Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. The reason why I was sitting there is because my husband of six months was just finishing a session of chemotherapy for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And this is when it hit me. It hit me that my husband had a chance to live because I was at one of the most advanced cancer centers in the world. Because my husband and I had access to the best treatment, and of course, to the best research. We were what I called the privileged few. We were one of the privileged few. This is when I made a vow. I made a vow that if and when we were able to come back to our country, Jordan, I would devote my life to the fight against cancer, and I would establish the Cancer Center of Excellence, to treat not only Jordanians, but patients from all over the Arab world. As you know, as you all know, cancer has no barriers. It invades every home, every household. Who of us can claim that cancer has not affected them one way or another? And here, I would like to ask each person in this room 
who has been affected by cancer directly or indirectly to stand up. So I rest my case, and now you can understand why I made this vow. A few years later, His Majesty King Abdullah appointed me as the head of the Amal Center. The Amal Center was a center taking care of cancer patients. It had two doctors, and after close attention, it was clear that it was tantamount to a morgue. There was no concept whatsoever of a standalone cancer center in the Arab world. And until today, the King Hussein Cancer Center remains the most prominent, comprehensive cancer center in the region. So the first thing I did was change the name of the center. I called it the King Hussein Cancer Center in honor of our beloved late king who fought so hard and with so much dignity and courage to fight his disease. But King Hussein did much more than that. He broke all the taboos concerning cancer in Jordan. He spoke about his illness openly. He was on every television screen all over the world. And he even removed his traditional headdress to show every cancer patient everywhere that it was not shameful to have cancer. After that, we had to move quickly. I insisted on putting the word cancer in the name of our center because I believed strongly that in order to defeat your enemy, you have to know it. And then I had to go immediately to the United States and meet with the leaders of cancer care to see if they would support us. I met with the NIH, the National Cancer Institute of the NIH, and with St. Jude's Children Research Hospital. They were incredibly supportive, and they sent a director to help us establish the King Hussein Cancer Center. Now, 14 years later, from two doctors, we have over 220 highly trained U.S. bordered, for the most part, oncologists, treating over 13,000 active cancer patients from all over the Arab world, including Syria, Yemen, Palestine, Iraq, countries where the health systems have been decimated. And this is when we realized, what do we do? Our priority was treatment, to deliver the highest quality and the safest treatment available. Because everything else was secondary. What is the use of treating a cancer patient halfway? We all know that it does not work with cancer. We accumulated accreditations by the world body that accredits hospitals, like JACO. We became the first cancer center in the developing world and the sixth in the world to receive an accreditation by JACO. Also, we developed strong partnerships with the National Cancer Institute, with St. Jude, but also with MD Anderson Cancer Center in Texas. So we were there. And only then did we feel that we could turn our attention to research. With regards to research, we have the King Hussein Cancer Center has published over 290 publications, many of them in highly prestigious journals such as the Journal of Clinical Oncology. We are also engaged in international phase two and phase three trials, including numerous research projects. One of them is a major collaboration with MD Anderson, and it involves BRCA testing which is the breast cancer gene, or otherwise known nowadays as the Angelina Jolie test. Um, I cannot say that our research is not yet at, at its infancy, but we have solidly entered the research stage at the King Hussein Cancer Center. And how could we not? How could we not enter the research arena? First of all, we have entered, we're living in the era of personalized medicine. 
the, the one-size-fits-all formula simply does not work anymore. It has really shown its limitations. And um, that's why, um, sorry, yeah. And we quickly realized, going back to your subject, Valentina, that we had to conduct, us Arabs have to conduct our own research for many reasons. First of all, the gene pools are different. The risk factors are different. The responses to particular treatments are different. And this is why we have no choice but to really do our own um, testing. And as a result of these experiences, the King Hussein Cancer Center has introduced sophisticated molecular testing to start targeted therapy to particular patients for different kinds of cancer. And we found out, to our horror, that uh, the BRCA gene mutations in breast cancer were much, much, much higher than we expected. <laughs> So all of this points to the fact, again, about how important it is to conduct our own research. Even if we have access to all the research from the West, we still remain different, and our patients are unique. And before I finish, I just want to make a call for action, one urgent call for action. Number one, to establish a pan-Arab collaborative research cancer group, and two, to establish a cancer fund. The reason why I'm saying this is we have four excellent cancer institutions in the Arab world. We have Jordan's King Hussein Cancer Center. We have the UAE's TWAM. We have Saudi Arabia's King Faisal. And we have Lebanon's AUBMC. Each one of these institutions can simply not perform R&D on its own. Um, for the following reasons, again. First of all, the costs are prohibitive. Not one country alone can sustain these costs. Number two, the experiences and qualifications in the four different centers is much larger, obviously, than if, if they were from one center. And finally, and most importantly, the number of patients needed to conduct effective clinical trials requires a huge amount of people and are not found in one country alone. And this is why it's my deepest wish that uh, we can start from today laying the grounds for such a pan-Arab collaborative research group and funding so that, inshallah, next year in Dubai, at the Conference of Knowledge, we can officially launch this pan-Arab research group. Thank you, Your Highness. Very interesting, especially the call for action. I think we need it very much. I'll go um, to our second panelist, Hugh Herr. Hugh, um, we were talking now about research. We'd like to ask you to tell us a little bit about innovation and what are the key ingredients in an innovative person or community in the 21st century? Great. Well, I'd like to uh, first uh, thank everyone. It's a privilege to be here today. Um, I, before addressing that question, I'd, I'd like to discuss uh, what I do uh, and, and what motivates uh, my research. Um, I'm a MIT professor, and uh, you can see on this slide, hopefully, uh, a blow-up shot of my artificial limbs. It's behind you. Great. Um, so here, here's a shot of me in, shortly after my legs were amputated in 1982 from frostbite. I was mountain climbing. Uh, and I woke up one day with a very, very new body, and I asked, what now? I asked my rehabilitation doctor at the time, what would I be able to do with my new body? Uh, I told him that I wanted to return to my chosen sport of mountain climbing. And he, without hesitation, said that that would not be possible. And uh, I, I'm happy to report that, that the doctor was wrong. So I returned to climbing just, thank you. Thank you. I, t I returned to climbing just um, about a month after my legs were amputated. 
Um, and how, how is that possible? I developed specialized prostheses um, that enabled me to return to the vertical world of rock and ice climbing. I basically started designing uh, uh, body parts, um, asking myself, how could, I, how could I architect the lower part of my limbs to be able to return to my passion of mountain climbing? As a young man, I asked myself, what could I, what could I envision and architect in this missing part of my biological body? And from that question, I started to develop all these bionic interventions. Um, given that both of my legs are amputated, I could actually change my height. I could be very short uh, or a towering, as you can see here, a towering three meters tall, able to reach hand and footholds that no one else can reach. From this uh, invention, from this innovation, I was actually able to climb more difficult walls than I'd ever been able to achieve uh, before the accident with biological limbs and walls that no one could climb, uh, whether with biologic or bionic limbs. So to convince you of that, here's a climb that I did in Yosemite Valley called a separate reality. So a, as a young man, I imagine a future world where all disabilities could be overcome through technological innovation, a world where uh, the seeing impaired could, could gain sight again from neural implants, a world where the paralyzed could walk via exoskeletons, a world in which we truly harness the power of innovation to end human limitation, to end disability. So I'd like to tell you about my legs now. I, I, today I'm an MIT professor. I founded the Center for Extreme Bionics. And one, one of the key innovations from the center is our bionic limbs. These limbs are made of uh, carbon, titanium, silicon, three microprocessors in each leg, 24 sensors, muscle tendon-like actuators. With these, I'm just completely free to do as I please. I can run, jump, and skip. Thank you. So in the center of, of extreme bionics at MIT, we're going beyond augmenting physicality uh, to also augmenting sensory experience and cognition. So in, in the context of innovation, um, how is innovation done? How is invention done uh, that ultimately leads to innovation? So a, a key methodology in the area of bionics, and I think this extends across many domains of invention leading to innovation is doing design through the lens of science. In the case of bionics, it's biological science because we want to develop technology that enhances a human capability, that augments human capability. So a key question is, what is the science of our bodies and how can that drive a future innovations uh, in bionics. So I'm going to go through uh, a few examples of how we're creating a digital human, a deep understanding of how the human brain works, how our bodies work, and then I'm going to talk about how that's motivating critical technologies that will augment human sensory experience, cognition, and physicality in this century. So um, colleagues at MIT are um, understanding how walking works, what are the muscles doing, and how are they controlled by the spinal level circuitry. This is motivating the design of limbs like this, also exoskeletons, which I'll talk about in a moment, that are worn by any person with biological limbs. We're also mapping the tissues of the body, understanding how stiff they are with very interesting uh, act, uh, robots, such as you see here. So such maps of the body are, are informing the design of synthetic skins, a mechanical interface between the biological body and built devices. So these, these sciences are creating a digital human um, and motivating new technology, new innovation. Uh, my colleague Ed Boyden is, is developing small implants that will go into the brain to bi-directionally put information into the brain and to get information out of the brain, to control any technology, any tech, uh, device on the exterior. 
We're also growing nerves, uh, developing small electronic packages that will talk to nerve endings by growing nerves through microchannel arrays and they'll attach to muscle and cell organs. We can sense how a person wishes to move. We can also stimulate through sensory axons, closing the loop between the machine and the human. These neural interfaces, electrical interfaces to the body are allowing incredible control fidelity to wearable robotic devices. This gentleman um, lost both limbs in a, a bomb blast in Afghanistan, and now he's able to walk up a rocky path, run up a rocky path with Bionix. So Bionix is enabling uh, this process of elimination of disability, and it's also enabling human augmentation. So here's a person with normal biological limbs um, running where the exoskeletal structure is reducing the amount of energy to walk and run, reducing the stress throughout the musculoskeletal system. I predict in a decade or two, when you walk down the streets of Dubai, you'll routinely see people wearing bionic devices to augment their phys physicality, sensory experience, and cognition. So I'll finish up on the note about uh, ending disability. So, Via innovation that has the foundation of a deep scientific understanding of, of humans and humanity, we have the opportunity in this century to end disability. Because of poor technology, because of technology that does not work in today's world, each condition results in a disability and a poor quality of life and assault. But disability can be overcome, human limitations can be overcome through technological innovations. I cannot, with a straight face, uh, give myself the label of being disabled. I run, I climb mountains, I do whatever I want because of great technology, because of the innovation that's happened. If you take the technology away from my body, I'm disabled, I'm crippled, I'm weak. But with technology, I'm freed uh, from the shackles of disability. So in this century, we have an opportunity for all these conditions that add up to uh, half of the world's population. We have an opportunity to innovate, to eliminate human limitation, and to set the technological foundation for an enhanced human experience, not only physically, but cognitively as well. So I'll finish up here. Um, this is uh, an extraordinary time in the area of Binex because we're reframing what it means um, to have human potential. So many people with conditions are viewed negatively by society. They're viewed as, as weak and perilous. Through, by changing our built world, our design world, by innovating, we can transcend human limitation and create a new precedent, a new human capability um, that is extremely important and powerful. So, great, I'll put a period there. Yes, I'll get back to, uh, to you to the, with the other questions. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll go to uh, Pete Morris. Pete, you've been working on something called Triple Helix. Could you please tell us more about it and how do you provide an encouraging environment for innovation in scientific research? Mm. Please, Tim. Salam alaikum. Thank you all for inviting me here. It's a great honor. I have the dubious pleasure of following that with you. That was an amazing presentation. So, yeah, let me talk to you a little bit about the, the Triple Helix, but first let me put it into context. I work for part of the University of Oxford. We are about the oldest English-speaking university uh, in the world. We've been teaching um, leading minds across the planet for the past 900 years, including... 26 British Prime Ministers, 51 Nobel Prize winners, and therefore this gives us the first element of the Triple Helix, academic excellence. Great minds produce great research, that's very clear, but great research on its own is not enough. Research for research's sake has not any value unless it's applied, unless it has impact on economy, on society, on people's lives as we've seen. So yes, 
Great minds do attract good research, and with research comes, and with great minds, come the desire to work with institutions, and hence funding, which becomes the third element of the triple helix. Academic excellence, government funding, and finally, as I mentioned at the start, application of this science. So industry, providing the application for science, academia, providing the expertise, the new ideas, the invention, and government funding, providing the enabler to make the research happen, to de-risk the process. And a great amount of research is funded by governments. In the UK, this is about 32% of all research that's carried out is funded by the government. And it plays a great role in setting up the right environment for research to be undertaken. But it's typically too risky for industry to, to fund on their own. So going back to the University of Oxford, how do we create the right environment for this triple helix, the founding of academics, industry, and funding? In 1987, they founded a separate technology transfer company named after, which is now somewhat rather unfortunate, the part of the River Thames which flows through Oxford. And the reason being to set this, this organization up was to give a complete focus on the application of Oxford science to the real world, to industry and to collaboration across the world. And now that company employs about 100 people. We have just won a prize for being the Technology Transfer Office of the Year and we do what we do very well. And in terms of our outputs, we work across the whole of the university, setting up collaborations with industrial companies and with other academic groups across the world. So there's some numbers for you now. We, we manage the entire intellectual property portfolio of the University of Oxford. That's 2,500 patents, 1,400 active technology licenses, and we undertake annually about 500 consultancy assignments every year. And we've been doing this, as I said, since 1987. So 11 years ago, coupled with the, the increase in, in the world for increasing levels of innovation and, and, and developing innovation ecosystems, we founded a separate division called Enterprise, whom I work for. And we spend our time working across the world, helping develop these innovation communities, identifying where, where the gaps are, where the relative deficiencies are, and helping build better ecosystems so that scientific research can result in real impact in the real world. So I see a huge potential with the, the combined merits of the United Arab Emirates for much more application of science, much more collaboration, and many more people working in this area. And I'm very proud to be contributing to that. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll go to Robin. Robin, you have a degree in philosophy, and you have a blog called Overcoming Bias which presses readers to consider which cultural taboos, ideological beliefs, or misaligned incentives might constrain them from making the right, the right or optimal decision. But there are myths between innovation, invention, so could you please let, tell us more about the myth that we're having so we have more knowledge between the two different issues? So long ago, I started out in physics, and then I spent nine years of computer research and I vividly remember that from that point of view, um, technical people like that didn't think social science exists. <laughs> and at that point, though, I started becoming a social scientist, and I have been for the last 22 years, and I can assure you that it does exist. <laughs> and social science actually knows a lot of things about the world and about how to invent things in social environments, and we also know about the process of innovation. And so I want to mention a few surprising things that you might not know about intervention, and I'll mostly just mention them here and they can serve as a taunt for you to ask me more. So first, most innovation is not invention. That is, invention is only a small part of innovation, uh, and it's perhaps the minor and the easy part that gets the most attention and, and press and prestige, but it's not the part you should focus on most. Most invention and innovation is not scientific. It's not very well grounded in 
uh, abstract or prestigious theories. It's much more grounded in practice. Uh, innovation doesn't need to be physical. Innovation is usually embodied often in physical devices, but at least half of it is often embodied in the social institutions around them. Most innovation that's adopted, even once it's adopted, is actually not valuable and has negative value. It's the few positive value ones that add total value. And most innovation is very small. That is, um, Nobel Prizes and big things uh, get the attention and press and awards, but in fact, most, the vast majority of the value of an innovation is in very small innovations that you'd hardly notice. Uh, academia is not designed for innovation. It's not even designed for research progress, per se. It's designed to produce prestige, and it does a very good job of that. So if you want an institution to produce innovation, you probably want something a little different, but then most people don't seem to want that. So I'll just stop there and leave those hanging. So Hugh, um, we were talking previously about innovation and many individuals, they don't know exactly what innovation is. How do you uh, define innovation? And how do you, and what are, going back to the, my previous question, what are the key ingredients in an innovative person or a community in our 21st century? Yeah, we, we were chatting to, to echo the, the previous comments. Uh, you know, in, in my life, I've invented hundreds of times. Uh, I have many, many patents, uh, but I've only innovated twice. Uh, innovation is very, very hard. When you take an idea, uh, an invention, and, and actually push it out into the world, that's the, the act of innovating. Um, the first time was an artificial knee uh, that's now being used by by people um, without a knee throughout the world. The second time is this foot ankle device that I'm wearing here today. So I think, uh, you know, less than 1% of US patents actually um, describe technology that's being used in society. So invention is straightforward, easy. It's an idea, it's written down on a piece of paper, but actually, uh, it's actually quite Herculean to take an idea produce technology that's manufactured, that's distributed, and uh, made available to society, or process, or, or whatnot. So, um, you know, I'm often asked, what are, what are kind of key ingredients to an innovative person um, or an innovative society? You know, of course, capital is very, very important. We all know that. Uh, Silicon Valley is, uh, would not be Silicon Valley today if it wasn't for a lot of people willing to put a great deal of capital at risk. Um, diversity is also important. It takes uh, a melting pot of human beings, men, women, um, people of, across age groups, people with gray hair, people with blonde hair, all types of people in a melting pot to be truly uh, inventive and to uh, do the necessary work um, and have the necessary agency to push inventions out and to actually innovate. Another, another critical ingredient is a kind of diversity of thought, um, ignorance, if you will, to disciplinary boundaries. To, to innovate the ankles that I'm wearing here today, it took so many uh, different types of disciplines. It took science. How the chips are programmed here uh, is based on a fundamental understanding of how muscles spanning the ankle joint are controlled by the spinal cord. Um, it took mechanical engineering. It took electrical engineering. It took design. It took art. You know, we're building body parts. It goes way beyond clothing. Aesthetics are very, very important. So to build a highly innovative society, we must train our young people to think across disciplinary boundaries. No longer can we afford to have mechanical engineers in a silo, artists in another silo, designers in a third silo, and so on and so forth. It's, it's still the case that incredible inventions, incredible innovations um, occur within a small group of people. So in today's world, we're kind of living in a renaissance. A person has to think across so many disciplines. They have to be a biologist. They have to be 
a mechanical engineer. They have to be an artist. They have to understand policy, reimbursement, um, uh, regulatory processes, how to get stuff out in the world, how to, be, uh, how to do effective business, and so on and so forth. So these, these, uh, sis, these highly innovative groups have individuals that think across interdisciplinary boundaries. And I'll finish up with, with one more comment that there's highly creative, inventive people are often childlike. They, are, they do what they do because they love exploration. And they don't believe trying things, that experimentation could ever be a failure. So as a fellow on my research team, that when we would build a prototype knee or ankle, and we'd test it, and there's many days where it didn't work. And this colleague of mine would just jump up and down with excitement. Yes, it didn't work. And I was like, why are you so excited? It didn't work. Our ideals were wrong. And he said, well, that means we're, just, we're this much closer to succeeding. <laughs> that's, that's the right mentality of a highly inventive per pe person. This uh, childlike uh, idea of exploration. You know, Edison... Uh, Thomas Edison would try anything. He was absolutely fearless, which is a property of a lot of our great inventors throughout history. One experiment Edison did was he took a tube and he held one end of the tube to his ear and the other end of the tube to a pendulum. You know what the experiment was? He wanted to see, could he think and move the pendulum? He was fearless. He would try anything. I can imagine back then his colleagues would just laugh at him because he'd try these ludicrous experiments. But because of that fearlessness, um, he stumbled upon really important uh, creations and inventions. So. Thank you. Let's say we have creative individuals, and let's say they are, they, we have the capital. But why do we have this brain drain um, across the world? Your Royal Highness, we have, we're suffering, our region suffers from a huge brain drain. And it's becoming more of an issue facing not just, let's say, Jordan or the region, but also we hear it from into different countries. How can we bring our scientists back? How can we bring our innovators back? Well, I, c I can speak about our region and our experiences. Um, the main um, incentive to bring uh, to, for brain gain is really uh, to set to have the proper uh, environment, the proper academic environment in, in, our, in our case as well. Uh, the whole experiment that I was mentioning earlier of the King Hussein Cancer Center moving from two doctors to 222 mostly U.S. trained oncologists. These were doctors who were um, Arab American doctors working in the United States. Now, the only reason why they would actually leave their job and move their families back to an unstable Arab world is primarily because they need the right academic environment to work in. They need to be able to publish. They need to be able to do research. Um, they cannot just come with what is prevalent, unfortunately, in our part of the world and just work in, you know, in any hospital with, that does not require you to, to publish, to, to produce. So um, this is one. The, the other thing in our part of the world that I have felt is if you are able to provide the right environment for doctors to come back, for example, um, then um, they, there is also that extra feeling of wanting to serve back your community and your, your people. And that is a very big deal. But having said that, uh, it is very, very hard to convince our Arab scientists and researchers and oncologists and doctors in the United States who are um, living in a stable environment uh, with their families, and also in a thriving environment w and having um, large salaries uh, to literally leave it all and come back to the region. We have to be able to in the region, and we try to also have good financial compensation because as 
he was saying, you know, this is also an important uh, component of it. So uh, it's extremely important to, uh, to cut the brain drain, but we have a duty to provide the right academic environment. Based on yes. that, yes. Uh, if I just come in on that, I think you're absolutely right. It's about creating the right environment and not just for, for academic research. One of the main things that goes wrong is you consider universities as the only place that innovation can happen. But then when you look at the way the universities are structured, their main function is teaching, then research, active commercialization and working with, with, with industry partners or other collaborators comes way down the list and academics typically aren't rewarded for this. So when you talk about the right environment, the reason why people flock to Silicon Valley or they flock to Cambridge or the Oxford ecosystem is because the elements of the innovation system are there for them. They're already joined up. There is the right culture. There is the right reward systems for people who take risks, who go out there and work with, with industrial companies. There is the access to capital. There is the access, in the case of um, Silicon Valley, to, um, to mentors, to expertise, ex-alumni of the university who are, who are there to mentor and help grow the next generation of companies and help academics break out of some of these silos. So I think it is absolutely right about the environment, the funding, and the physical location um, to get innovation out into the real world. Let, let, me, let me pile on there to say that often uh, people have events even like this where they want to promote innovation and they have speakers talk about how to be creative and how to think outside the box and showing you examples of other people being creative as if the main limitation was your personality and your attitude. And in fact, usually the limitation is much more the organizational context. So like we said, uh, often interdisciplinary skills are often required to make key breakthroughs, but academia and other institutions don't reward collecting interdisciplinary skills together in one place. And so it's finding institutions that can reward or at least tolerate or not punish, really, people for <laughs> trying things out that's uh, really more the key than thinking outside the box or being creative. Can I, can yeah. I just yeah. ask you, if, if you if, just for one clarification, when you were saying, that, uh, talking about the difference between innovation and invention. So is invention, when you carry it further, uh, you know, with further creativity to make it become an innovation, or is it when, as you said, when it comes out in uh, in the public sphere? I mean, yeah. when when you actually yeah. are and using a, it. And a, do a document that certifies that I've invented something is is a patent. Okay. As an example. Yes, that's um, an invention. But what I'm wearing here is an innovation. Because what have you done? Uh, because I've taken an idea yeah. and I've translated out into society. Okay, that's why. So right. it's actually so, being used yeah. in society. Right. So that innovation is so hard because it involves inventing, yes, but it also involves uh, the processes of uh, developing a technology, manufacturing a technology, getting a technology approved by government bodies, um, distributing a technology, marketing a technology, etc., etc., etc. You know, to get to a point uh, for something like this where you can fit it on thousands of people and it's safe and it works um, is very, very hard. Just to give you a sense, um, you know, I, I probably file two patents every month. But again, I've innovated twice in my life. And each time I've innovated, it's taken 15 years and I get, you know, more and more gray hairs. <laughs> so in a person's, in a single life, one can only innovate a few times. But um, is this possible for everyone to be able to acquire um, your bionic legs? It, how can we make inventions or innovations accessible to all? And this question is to all of you. How can we make it accessible to all? I'm sure not everybody can afford bionic limbs. Um, and well, that's, that's the key to solving this problem of only very wealthy nations of the world um, being able to afford high-tech, for example, medical devices. You know, one can innovate <laughs> to solve that problem. So there's, there's people thinking about uh, dis globally distributed uh, fabrication. So the, there's a professor at MIT, Neil Gershenfeld, 
who's putting in what he calls fab lab across uh, very poor regions of the world. A fab lab uh, has very sophisticated fabrication tools. In a fab lab, you can build ele electronic boards, you can build um, uh, machine devices, you know, from uh, farming equipment to medical device, uh, all types of devices. This will enable local communities uh, to A, design technology that reflects their own needs and culture, and B, actually within their community, uh, fabricate uh, technology. So with such a local uh, fabrication model, uh, one can uh, reduce costs tremendously. This device um, now sells for tens of uh, thousands of dollars, U.S. dollars. Uh, but if you had such a framework of local uh, fabrication, you could develop even this uh, type of high-tech device at very, very low cost. So that, that kind of uh, world of open source design, uh, where all communities can access design, okay. local uh, manufacturing, will ultimately drive prices very, very low and produce an even playing field across the world. Great, thank you. Professor Hansen. So there's an old saying uh, that an engineer is somebody who can make for one dollar what any fool can make for two, which is to say that an awful lot of innovation is about making things cheaper, not necessarily changing the idea. And a lot of innovation is also about application and use and invention in applications and use. So just the basic idea needs a lot of honing via use. So f let me give you a statistic uh, that should sh shock you if you think about it, which is in the United States at least, large hospitals and small hospitals have similar mortality rates for procedures uh, for going in for a condition, even though two factors should seem to favor large hospitals. One, for any one procedure, a hospital that does it more often has lower mortality rates. And second, new procedures tend to show up first at large hospitals and only later on get adopted by small hospitals. Both of these factors would seem to favor large hospitals, but in fact, large hospitals have about the same mortality as small. What's the resolution? The resolution is that new procedures are bad. <laughs> and this is true for innovation in general. Uh, innovation is a, usually a stream of new ideas and new things to try out, most of which won't last because most of them aren't worthy of lasting. You have to try out a bunch and figure, find the few that last. So as a practical advice, if you have a condition, what you want to do is go to a large hospital, but only let them do the procedure that a small hospital would also do. <laughs> uh, before I go to the audience, I need to ask you, Pete, one question. If we have enough funding, do you think our region will be able to move in innovation and research and development? Mm. This is a very good point about whether funding is the answer to everyone's problems. And I'm reminded of a, of a film featuring Kevin Costner called Field of Dreams. Now, in this film, he was, in his dreams, he was told to build a baseball stadium on the basis that if you build it, they will come. And I think that analogy, analogy can be applied to funding for scientific innovation. If you build it, they won't necessarily come. You need all the elements. You can't just have brand new facilities, access to capital for funding to, for the science and expect it all to happen. The key ingredient to make it all stick together are the people. Technology commercialization, innovation, technology transfer, whatever name you want to call it, is a contact sport based on people to people. You need people who are willing to take risks, who are able to translate concepts from the academic world into the world of business. Those innovative, innovative well-trained, well-motivated, well-rewarded people, that's what also needs the focus, as well as the funding, the facilities, and the science behind it. Great, okay, thank you. And do we have questions from the audience? Can we have the mic here, please? Uh, my question is, actually, before I ask, uh, I would like to quote His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid. He said, يجب أن نتعود ألا نتعود in his book, My Vision, which means, basically, we have to get used, not to get used. 
he, he was talking about doing things differently. Anyways, uh, a friend of mine who works in one of the famous airlines asked me uh, how can we maximize or increase the number of seats in the airplane uh, and he asked as well to think outside the box. I went directly and googled how to think outside the box. Uh, the results asked a child. Then I went to my friend and I told him to ask the child. So basically that was uh, the meaning of it, uh, that the child, he does not work, his brain doesn't work on the policies and regulations and uh, rules in your organization that was programmed in your mind that made you work within a frame. So my question is, what is the role of the rules and regulations in any organization to discourage innovation? Because uh, as an employee, when you work, you have to do, you have a do and don'ts. You have your daily task. You, you come at the morning uh, from eight to four o'clock to do a certain task to complete them. When you are full, your time is fulfilled with these tasks, uh, when, when your boss tells you do and uh, do that and do that and don't do that, how can employees uh, get the correct or the right environment to be creative and innovative? And this is my question. Thank, Thank you. you. Can we have another question? Like we have two, three questions and then go back to you, okay? Um, can you go take that question over there? This time I will talk in Arabic, if you don't mind. I do not think that the Arab world is going to return to the Arab world. I think that it is the best way to think about the protection of our lives before they return to Europe and the United States. I think that there is a great opportunity to face the Arab world, at least in Dubai, for the presence of a person like Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, يدعم هذا التوجه الأموال موجودة إذا احنا ما نعرف كل شيء بس نعرف من يعرف عندنا النتورك على مستوى العالم نستطيع أن نحول أفكار عيالنا إلى واقع من خلال أموالنا من خلال البحث العلمي الحقيقي ومن خلال اتصالاتنا مع الغرب ومع الشرق أنا أدعو من هذا المكان إلى تحويل أفكارنا إلى واقع إذا كان المخترع عبارة عن شخص غرقان يبحث عن مكان آمن في لايت في فنار أنا أعتقد أن دبي قد تكون أحد المنارات الموجودة وتكون عاصمة المخترعين والمبدعين وأن ينشأ الاتحاد العربي للمخترعين داخل هذه الإمارة داخل هذه الدولة على الأقل يكون بصيص أمل لنا في واقعنا في العالم العربي السيء الموجود يمكن على الاقل تعطونا حلم بان احنا نقدر نسوي شيء ونصدر الى الغرب بدل ما نكون احنا مجرد قوم تبع شكرا جزيلا شكرا شكرا Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Dr. Jasmine Ali, I'm from Dubai Media Incorporated. His Highness Sheikh Mohammed put an extreme challenge for public and private sector, which is about the innovation. I think we, as the managers and the leaders, in the organization, especially in the public sector. The innovation concept is new. You are, as the leaders, what type of features and characteristics that the leaders should uh, possess in terms of creating a better environment which is allowed employees to be more innovative in their organization? Thank you. Thank you. Another question? There at the back. Uh, 
Hello. Um, thank you, all the wonderful speakers. Uh, we all know that the, uh, I'll introduce myself. My name is Moya Datum. Um, we all know that the output um, of R&D in the Arab world and knowledge production is quite low. And this is recently shown in the Global Innovation Index. I'd like to ask uh, the opinion of the panelists. Uh, what advice would you give us to the Arab world in order to increase knowledge production? Uh, is it up to governments to uh, fund R&D, or do you think private sector plays a role? Thank you. Thank you. Um, the question is over there. Please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for so many wonderful frameworks of innovation and acceleration. I see two uh, commonalities which are emerging here. One is funding, and the second is accessibility once it is ready for commercialization. So why not we put right in the beginning when we are funding or employing people for that funding to be utilized for innovation, that we set two limits. Limit number one is time, that this is the time within which something must come out. And the second is the cost, that this is the cost within which it should come out. And here I would put uh, the example of world's most innovative company, which is 3M. 3M has put both of them in practice, the time limit as well as cost limit. That will take care of the innovation speed as well as innovation accessibility. I would like panel uh, people to uh, uh, you know, comment upon these two aspects, which will probably bring out the innovation to be faster as well as more accessible. My name is Professor Mohan. Thank you. Um, Move on. Princess, uh, would you like to answer uh, oh. if uh, the rules and regulations would discourage innovation? Um, we can, any of the panelists, would you like to answer another question? Another so, question. So, uh, rules and policies that hinder innovation, is yes. that the question? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I'm from the MIT Media Lab, and it's, uh, the Media Lab is structured in, a, in an, an unusual way. Um, basically, the only role at the Media Lab is that each member has to invent and innovate at an aggressive pace. And if you don't, uh, you're fired, basically. So um, there's an expectation to be creative and inventive uh, within the institution. Um, but beyond that, there's uh, really no structure or rules set up. Um, even, even the funding, the... The, fund, the funder of the Media Lab uh, does not dictate, you should work on this problem, researcher, uh, and the solution should look like this. No, money's uh, given to the lab, uh, into these consortia, uh, without, any, um, with, uh, without any rules or statement about what the researcher should work on, uh, what... what uh, what is important to work on. Uh, so in, in the Media Lab, researchers have a financial pot to use, use these monies to completely explore and to pursue their passions and what they think is important. Now that sounds risky um, as a funding model, but um, history has shown that it, the lab has produced very, very important inventions and innovations. Uh, by simply having the funder get out of the way and to allow uh, highly innovative people to innovate. Um, so that's, that's uh, the lack of rules, I think, is interesting about how the Media Lab works. Would any of you would like to comment on uh, this, this question? So I'd like to suggest that not invented here is one of the major obstacles. Uh, that is, in many organizations, uh, there's a prestige for being the originator or the celebrated person who is associated with an invention. And there's often uh, too much prestige and attention focused on being the inventor rather than on assimilating inventions from elsewhere and being the person who diffuses and moves innovations. Uh, because, in fact, the vast majority of places where innovations will be adopted will be places where they didn't invent it, but they adopted it from elsewhere. And that makes perfect sense. 
So uh, the more you can, in fact, it's less important that the Mideast do a lot of original research than it just have people who can track other research and adopt it when necessary. And in fact, paying them to do their own research is my, maybe the price you have to pay <laughs> to get them around and working near you so they can track things for you and then find them and bring them in. So again, less about invention and more about adoption and tracking. Thank you very much. Can I just say something about the, the research, this question? We, we, we cannot compare ourselves. The Arab world cannot compare itself to the West in any way, shape, or form with regards to, uh, you know, to, with regards to anything to do with basic research. We do not even conduct basic research, which is phase one of any uh, clinical trial. So what Professor Herr is saying, you know, we really, really have a long way to come. We have to start from the basics. We have to start publishing. We have to start um, participating, participating in joint research projects. We have to start making partnerships with major institutions outside. And it's going to take us decades to reach where the West has reached. But that's okay. We can start, and we are starting. But we sh you know, one, it's easy to feel intimidated when we hear Professor Hur speaking. But the West, the United States, for example, England, of course, have been at it you know, for hundreds of years. So it's okay. We can give ourselves a bit of a break. But we need to start. We are ignoring research. The mere fact in, in the call of action that I, I called for, the Pan-Arab Collaborative Cancer Research Group, the mere fact that the Arab world does not have a joint research collaborative group is shameful, sad, whatever one wants to call it. We need to do that because our people are different. I'd just like to, uh, yeah. I'd just like to challenge that a little bit, though. Uh, there isn't one set model for an economy to evolve its research capabilities and its innovation the ecosystem. There are many different ways of doing it, and you can capitalize on your strengths. So I'd definitely like to pick up on the, your point of collaboration, collaboration with the West to, to take early-stage research and develop it through joint research projects at the later um, stages to get better partnerships with industry to use your, your access to, to the capital markets as a way of your competitive advantage. It is often in the most surprising places you find the most incredible innovations and ways of working. We work a lot in places like Colombia, where it's easy to, to write off the, the science there as somehow second class to the Western world. Rubbish. They have student entrepreneurs out there who are starting their own projects. They are still doing their undergraduate degree gaining six, seven figures worth of funding for some most incredible innovations. The application of nanoparticles in clothing to give inbuilt UV protection. Some really cutting edge applications of science from the place you least expect it. But I think it's by knowing what your competitive strengths and weaknesses are, identifying partnerships around the world, because knowledge is a global product, by, by identifying those partnerships, you can shortcut your way to developing an ecosystem. You don't have to go through what the Oxfords, the MITs, the Cambridges of these worlds did and do the same path. You can shortcut that. Thank you. Uh, well, I think we, uh, our time is up. As we can see, we only have 22 seconds. Um, would you like to um, give a final word to, um, to our audience and say, how do you suggest we move on as to start in our region? What's the first thing we should focus on? <laughs> well, we mentioned funding, we mentioned uh, government, we mentioned private sector involvement, we mentioned um, giving them enough time um, to start in order to go back to, uh, to the basics. So, and we, um, and Her Royal Highness gave us a call for action where we should have a center for research, plus we have a pool of funding for cancer research. Anything else that we should be looking into or um, additional stuff other than what we mentioned? Perfect. So, thank you very much. Thank you for, your, for listening. Thank, thank you. you.
حضورنا الكرام وصلنا إلى ختام فعاليات اليوم من مؤتمر قمة المعرفة لعام 2015 نلقاكم إن شاء الله غدا في نفس المسيرة للعطاء والتميز والابتكار دمتم بعافية